Welcome to the latest episode of Mentors at Your Benchside. I'm Adam Pawson. As a follow-up to our podcast about ethanol precipitation of DNA and RNA, and you can find a link to it in the description of this episode, today we'll cover the differences between DNA precipitation in ethanol and isopropanol to help you figure out which method is the best choice for your experiment. First, let's review the components we need to precipitate DNA or RNA with ethanol. First, you need salt to neutralize the charge of the nucleic acid backbone. This causes the DNA to become less hydrophilic and precipitate out a solution. Next, you need ice to chill the sample. Lower temperatures promote the flocculation of the nucleic acids, so they form larger complexes that pellet under the centrifugal forces of a microcentrifuge. You also need a nucleic acid concentration high enough to force the DNA out of solution. If the concentration is not high enough, you can add a carrier nucleic acid or glycogen to enhance the recovery. And finally, you need a microcentrifuge to pellet the sample. DNA is less soluble in isopropanol, so it precipitates faster even at lower concentrations. The downside, however, is that salt will also precipitate in isopropanol. With ethanol, the DNA needs to be at a higher concentration to flocculate, but the salt tends to stay soluble, even at colder temperatures. DNA precipitates in 35% isopropanol and 0.5 molar salt. Using ethanol, the final concentration needs to be around 75% with 0.5 molar salt. So for the typical precipitation protocol, Isopropanol is added from between 0.7 to 1 volumes of sample, and ethanol is added at 2 to 2.5 volumes of sample. If you are precipitating small volumes of DNA, and you can fit the required amount of solvent into a a single sample tube, then the ice-cold ethanol is the preferred choice. You can chill it in liquid nitrogen or at minus 80 degrees C to accelerate the precipitation without the risk of precipitating excess salt. Afterwards, you need to wash the pellet with 70% ethanol to remove any salt present. Isopropanol is useful for large sample volumes, example the eluids you get after using a large volume plasmid kit. Because less isopropanol is needed for precipitation, you can often fit your sample and the solvent in one 15 ml tube. However, because salts are generally less soluble in isopropanol than in ethanol, they tend to co-precipitate with DNA. To minimize the likelihood of salt precipitation, isopropanol precipitation is best performed at room temperature with short incubation times. Once you recover the DNA or RNA pellet from the isopropanol, wash it with cold 70% ethanol to remove excess salt and to exchange the isopropanol for ethanol. It is okay to chill the isopropanol precipitated sample if you are sure the sample doesn't contain a lot of salt. Because DNA is less soluble in isopropanol, isopropanol allows precipitation of larger species and lower concentrations of nucleic acids than ethanol, especially if you incubate at low temperatures for long periods of time. If you do this, just remember to wash the pellet several times in 70% ethanol after pelleting to reduce the amount of salt you carry over. So in summary, should you use ethanol or isopropanol? Use ethanol if you have the space to fit two volumes of ethanol to sample in your tube. If the sample needs to be stored for a long period of time and will be chilled, or if you want to precipitate very small DNA fragments. Use isopropanol if your sample volume is large and you can only fit one volume of solvent into your tube. If you need large molecular weight species, the DNA concentration of your sample is low, or if you're in a hurry and want to accelerate the precipitation of nucleic acids at room temperature. And here are some handy tips. For ethanol precipitation of DNA, add two volumes of ethanol to the sample and freeze at minus 20 degrees C for at least one hour or overnight for best results. Centrifuge the sample at full speed for 20 minutes to collect all material. Wash with 70% ethanol, then centrifuge for 10 to 15 minutes to pellet the DNA. Remember to mark the side of the tube where the pellet is expected to be, and don't let it out of your sight when decanting the ethanol. For isopropanol precipitation of DNA, avoid cold temperatures because the excess salt precipitation can occur. You can increase the yields precipitated by incubating the sample mixture at room temperature for longer periods rather than chilling the sample. 
When the DNA is pelleted, the pellet is sometimes more difficult to see compared to the ethanol pellet. It can be clear and glassy. Make sure again to note the side of the tube where the pellet should be. Look for it before decanting the isopropanol and 70% ethanol wash. After washing with ethanol, the pellet becomes more visible and white. Make sure it doesn't slip off the side of the tube wall before decanting the supernatant. Allow the tube to drain upside down for a few minutes, let it air dry, or use a centrifugal evaporator, 5 minutes should be enough, and then resuspend in buffer. Finally, for dry DNA pellets, heating the sample in buffers 50 to 60 degrees C will help the DNA dissolve faster and won't damage the DNA. There's a link in the episode description to more information on what can damage your DNA. Heating is also suitable for RNA in a water bath at temperatures not exceeding 42 degrees C. Overdried DNA or RNA will take longer to dissolve, so make sure not to evaporate for too long. So now you know the difference between ethanol and isopropanol precipitation and when to use each method. Good luck with your DNA precipitations. Check out the episode description for links to related articles and resources and subscribe to get more advice and help from mentors at your bench side.